was Jocko like? What was he like as a person? He had some great stories. Sure. He put on the heavy weather record, and, and he was going through and he was telling stories about what this is what was going on while we were recording this, and this is what we were going to we record that. And I, I said, you know, how do you finger Teen Town? Because I always do it like this. He said, no, you do it like this. I said, really? He said, that's how you do it. Welcome back to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we are chatting today with John Liebman of Four Bass Players Only and JohnLiebman.com. John and I have been chatting for the last six months about trying to figure out a time to do an interview. We were both at ISB 2017. I went by the booth. We grabbed about 30, 45 minutes and dug into all kinds of topics, like the opening clip you heard about Jocko, how John got into writing books. He's written seven books, I think, at this point for Hal Leonard, lessons learned from interviewing over 500 people. John's interviewed over 500 bass players for his website for bass players only, many other topics. Great to catch up with John. And I always have a good time sitting down and chatting with someone who does a lot of interviews. I always learn a lot in that process. I'd also like to thank Dario Strings for sponsoring not only Contrabass Conversations, which they've been doing for quite a while at this point, but also sponsoring the ISB convention, and they're going to be sponsoring Bass Europe. They do so much for the bass community, and I really thank them for doing that. And I'd like to give you a chance to win a set of Kaplan strings, which are the strings that I'm using right now, and I totally love them. Go to ContrabassConversations.com slash strings to enter to win a chance. And you can join the community of people that do use D'Addario strings like Gary Carr, Klaus Freudenstein, Andres Martin, David Allen Moore, and so many others. I'd also like to thank the Bass Violin Shop, which offers the Southeast's largest inventory of laminate, hybrid, and carved double basses. And they also have bass bows, French bows, German bows, everything from entry-level student bows to fine pedigree bows. Each bow is personally selected prior to sale to ensure that customers can choose from the very best. And you can see what they've got in the bow department at BassViolinShop.com. Okay, here we go with our conversation with John Liebman. What's changed for you just like as an interviewer? I, I, I think that'd be interesting. Like most people haven't done any interviews, right? And you're at 500 or 500 plus when they yeah. come out here. So like if you look at like interview number one and like now, like what do you ask? What do you, have you have, Has your process changed? It's it's gotten more polished, okay. definitely. Okay. And I wasn't even doing the video interviews at the beginning. That didn't come till much later. Yeah. And when I first launched the site, to be honest with you, I didn't know what it was going to be. Yeah. I just I started that because I had started another site called JohnLeapman.com. Right. And the inspiration for that was an email, a random email I got from some kid, I think in England. And he said, John Liebman, I love your books. I love your stuff. I love what you do. I looked all over the internet. I can't believe there's no JohnLiebman.com. <laughs> and I just took my hand and slapped my forehead. And I said, whoa. And I said, well, it is at the time it was 2008. Okay. And that made a lot of sense. Right. So without knowing what I was doing, I, uh, I got I think, some manuals and some software and Google and YouTube, and I threw up something called JohnLiebman.com, and I didn't even know what that was going to be. And uh, shortly after, and then, you know, I was selling my books, and I had yeah. some audio download examples of my bass playing and, and my instructional stuff. And then I was reading an article one night, and... <laughs> you know, just learning the whole science of the internet and the web and, yeah. and niche marketing and all of that. And th the gist of it was, hey, Jason, as wonderful as I am, it can't be all about me, me, sure. me. Right. So uh, I, this the name just popped into my head for bass players only. And, and I thought about it the whole next day. And then I, I called up GoDaddy and I got the, the URL and I just went back to work and put up something that was comparable to JohnLiebman.com. Okay. Neither one was very good because I'm the first to, to admit I had no idea what I was doing. Sure. Yeah. 
And I launched that site on uh, June 1st, 2009. Okay. And I didn't even know what it was going to be, just a resource for bass players. So I was looking for news and I was looking for links and all kinds of information. And somebody said, are you going to do interviews? And I said, well, I've never even thought of that. Yeah, well, maybe I'll try. So my very first interview was June 15th, 2009. And the player is Glenn Letch, who was playing with Robin Trower at the time. He's written some books for Hal Leonard, and he's done all kinds of freelance stuff for everybody. The name Orville Redenbacher stands out in my mind. You remember the popcorn Uh, guy? I remember Orville (laughs) Redenbacher. Yeah, that's taking me back. But in answer to your question, uh, I would start out just seeking out bass players that I thought were interesting. And I said, I I have a website. It's called forbassplayersonly.com want to be interviewed for it and you know people would get back yeah sure and i would just email some questions Mm -hmm. and ask them to email back their responses yeah and then i would edit them and sometimes they needed more editing than other times (laughs) grammar and you know those kinds of things but uh then i did a handful of telephone interviews and i thought you know what that it's it's so much more time consuming but you get such a you know such a much better interview when you do that and then I started going to Bass Player Live and started going to NAM. I used to go to the NAM shows all the time. And then I had a diversion and you know, I got married and had kids and then took over the family business and just was in a whole different right. headspace. Right. And then I started getting back into I started going to NAM and started doing more interviews. And, uh, and then I started going to other things like Lords of the Low End and whatever other bass... Co- Uh, ISB, International Society of Bassists. So those are great opportunities to get video interviews. And when I look back at some of the early ones, you know, well, like I said before, I guess it's just more polished. And I I do quite a bit of research and reading up so I know. And and it's another, it's a tricky thing. Like when I interviewed Carol Kay, for example, or or some other, you know, big names or well-known people, I don't necessarily like to ask the same questions that they've been asked a million times by so many other people. And sometimes I am guilty of that, but sometimes there are people that just don't know the answers to those. And I would, I would have my basic formula of questions. Uh, Tell me about your musical upbringing. You come from a musical family. How'd you become a bass player? Who were your bass heroes, your bass influences? Did you start listening to music differently once you discovered the instrument? Uh, Tell me about the new record. Tell me about the tour. What's keeping you busy? What about the future? And then I have my, my, uh, uh, my trademark sign-off question: What would you be if you weren't a bass player? Uh, sure. And some people I've interviewed more than once, so you can't ask all the same questions. So right. usually there's a reason for a follow-up interview, though. Uh, the reason I want to do it because it's been so long since I uh, interviewed Christian McBride yesterday. We had a great interview. I said, Christian, I was reading the, the last interview we did. It was 2000. And- 11. Mm-hmm. So, and I, I'll mention that. We, you know, we got the whole story of your proud Philadelphia heritage and your musical upbringing and your experience with Juilliard and all the stuff you did with James Brown. And I'll say, and by the way, that media, that uh, interview was up there. Go to forbassplayersonly.com and the little search thing, put yeah. Christian McBride. It'll pop right up as well as lots of other news stories that we've done about you. But let's talk about what's keeping you busy now. You just got the Bruce Lundvall Award. You're doing the NPR thing. You're doing the Sirius XM thing. What kind of equipment are you using? What about the, you know, so in a very long roundabout answer, somewhere in there was an answer to your question. No, I no, think. no. It's interesting to hear process and doing and like following up with, I love doing, I call them round twos with people. Well, that's know? good. Yeah. Because the, <coughs> pardon me, the first, the first, a lot of the time, some of that introductory, like what, like, like a little bit about their background, that kind of thing, you dig into that maybe. And then, yeah, like you're saying, maybe they've, they've got a new direction that they're going in their life, whether it's uh, starting up like with Christian, I think he's involved in the Newport Jazz Festival yes. now and all these other things. I love it. You mentioned Philadelphia, him, his heritage. I, we were both at his amazing concert last night. Yes. And, right? and, and I love it. He got up there and someone went like, Philly! Yeah. From the crowd. And yeah, he loved that. What a class act. So like, what's something... What's something you would were dying to ask Christian McBride? Like, what, what were you dying to know about this guy before you ever interviewed him? Yeah, you know, there's, there's nothing that I was really dying to know about that person, but it brings up another question. Uh, sometimes I'll interview somebody, like when I interviewed Chris Squire from Yes, and you see some of the comments, how could you not ask him about fill in the blank, whatever yeah. it is. So I try to think of uh, content is, is key. What 
would be the most interesting thing about this person that I'm interviewing, whether yeah. it's Christian McBride or somebody else. What is it that I think people want to know? Yeah. And what is it that I want to know? Right. And sometimes it, it would be like... Uh, he, he did a lot of stuff with James Brown. So in the previous interview with Christian, I would ask him something like, you know, tell me something about James Brown that most people don't know. Mm -hmm. So that is one example of the kinds of things. You know, what, what I was dying to ask him, I, I can't think of anything specific other than the, the general things that I mentioned. Yeah. I want to know what, what's keeping you busy? What are you working on? A lot of times I'll ask about uh, technique. I interviewed Francois Rabath the other day. That was very special. And I said that there are two things I want to ask you about. Your left hand and your right hand. Because <laughs> he's got these very innovative things that he came up with. And he's, he's got the, the pivot Mm -hmm. which is a way to keep your thumb in the same place but move your fingers up and down so you don't have to shift. And then he's got a technique called the crab, mm -hmm. which was inspired from a, 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 a crab that he saw on the beach one day. And he says, look at the way the crab is moving its legs and it's so efficient. And yeah. Why can't we do that on the base? And of course, we talked about the right hand and the bowing. So yeah, if there's something, uh, I'm sure I'll come up with an example. I've interviewed over 500 bass players, so there, there might be, something about uh, that person that, that you know, I've always wanted to know. We have Paul McCartney as one of those interviewers. I, I, I always, there we go. Nice. I, I always said, you know, if I interviewed Paul McCartney, what could you possibly ask him that he hasn't been asked a million times? And I've got a, a fantastic uh, managing editor, Gary Graf, who, who has brought me. He, he does most of the interviews for uh, one of my other sites called for guitar players only so uh, he's the one that brought me uh, Peter Frampton and Steve Miller and Carl Santana and Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck and uh, hey if your listeners are interested fourguitarplayersonly.com is one of our other sites but uh, the reason I mention that is because Gary is the one that interviewed Paul Yeah. Okay. and cool. uh, boy you just uh, you know, how do you top that when you interview Paul I've, I've well, been, just the experience of sitting next to somebody like Paul McCarty and getting a chance to like geek out I mean well, it's so compelling I love following everybody should check out four bass players only and four guitar players only for sure there's so many great episodes I mean you, you just mentioned a few you got you got the Christian McBride and then following up with him and uh, Francois Raboth which how cool is that to talk to him like what are, what are and I'm sure you've interviewed John Patitucci yeah. in the past who are some other people that maybe we know of as double bassists who are some other people that uh, folks should check out on the site double bassists okay yes I almost forgot who I'm talking to Jason Heath here Mr. Double Bass Patitucci you mentioned yeah. Ron Carter Ron Carter Dave right. Holland yeah um, uh, well, you're putting me on the spot here, but I, I know... <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a good list right there. Yeah. That's, no, that's no shabby list. But it, it was interesting when I was talking to... Uh, I was interviewing Gary Carr the other mm -hmm. day, mm -hmm. and I said, it, it's really exciting to be talking with you, and you provide a nice balance to the list of interviews, and I am probably threw out the number 500 interviews that we've done on For Bass Players Only. And I said, and, and that list includes Gary... Geezer Butler from Black Sabbath and Robert Trujillo from Metallica and I was joking I said maybe you caught those but <laughs> but on the complete other end of the spectrum I said I've interviewed Jeff Bratitich yeah. I've interviewed Terry Plumeri uh -huh. I've interviewed uh, Larry Hutchinson yeah. and and Gary Carr that's, so that's that's the other end of the spectrum so we've got the, the heavy metal rock guys we've got the, the classical guys we've got the hardcore jazz guys oh Avery Sharp is another one he was with McCoy Tyner for 20 some years um, and and some some rock oriented and some more moderate. Well, David Ellefson from Megadeth and and uh, Tom Hamilton from Aerosmith. The, uh, like so before you got going with JohnLeben.com and all this. So the books, right? I mean, like we're sitting here at ISB and I'm watching people come up and like, oh, John, you know, like I lo love your books and you've published eight. Is it eight? I, th books. I think so. Something like how, it. How did you get into that? What was book number one? Like funk what, base. Funk base. Okay. How did that? How did t tell us about just like how the evolution of that? How 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 do you become a, a I know, well known was, author? I was. Uh, I had graduated from University of Miami. I was still living down in Florida, and I had started to get involved in the Latin music scene. And we had a really cool gig down in Colombia. 
South America. We did a whole tour with Cali, Bogota, Mid. I was in Medellin, Colombia in 1986. That's um, an interesting time to be in Medellin, <laughs> yeah. Colombia. Wow. Uh, that's another story for another podcast I'll fill you in <laughs> on, but I'm uh, very happy to be alive. Uh, my roommate, still a good friend of mine, Ray Sanchez, Ray R E Y. His name is Reynaldo. And we were uh, we, we shared a hotel room, so I'm sitting on my bed with my bass, and I'm just slapping the bass, just you know, being funky. And he said, "You know, you ought to you ought to write that stuff down. You ought to write a book." I, said, I can't write a book. What are you talking about? At the time, Ray was the guitar editor for Columbia Pictures Publications, which became CPP Bellwin, which became Alfred. No, it became Warner Brothers, and now it's Alfred. So it's one of the big uh, music publishing companies. And uh, we, we talked about it, and we, we, we still reminisce about it. I remember, John, we went downstairs across the street, and we got a pizza, and we're sitting in this outdoor, you know, the sidewalk thing, eating the pizza, and we're talking about it, and, and I'm getting excited, and we're exchanging ideas. And I went home and just started putting down some notes and thinking it through and conceptualizing it. And then I put together a, an outline that, you know, that must have been in... Actually, thinking back, it's, it's a long time ago, 1986, right? So uh, it, it was actually not till a couple of years later I put together an outline, a proposal, more like it, and uh, went to a NAM show, probably 90, 91, and started shopping it around. And right away, I got an offer from Warner Brothers, got an offer from Cherry Lane, uh, which is now part of Hal Leonard, yeah. got an offer from Hal Leonard, and that just made the most sense at the time. And I talked to John Patitucci because he was, at the time, the hot, fairly new guy at the time. He's a great upright player, but also right. a great electric sure. player, yeah, and six, the whole six-string thing, but a great slapping guy. And I wanted to get him to write the foreword. And he says, you know, I've, I've got some stuff with Hal Leonard. If you end up going with Hal Leonard, I'll do it. But if you go with somebody else, I'd, I'd like to maintain my loyalty to Hal Leonard. And I thought, what a gentleman, you know. So that's how that first book came out. And I, I also approached Will Lee, who endorsed it. Uh, Brian Bromberg has been my friend for forever. Stu Ham, same thing. Rich Appleman, who was the head of the Berkeley Bass Department for some 40 years, Berkeley College of Music. Uh, Mark E. Egan endorsed it, and anyway, so now I'm in the book writing business. That came out, the, boy, the original idea was planted by Ray in my head in September of 1986, and after a couple of years, you know, putting down notes, and then you, you got to make a commitment, you know, either I'm going to write this book or I'm not, so I finished it, I submitted it, we finalized it, we got everything done, it came out, I think, November of 1992. Okay. And okay, now I'm an author. I'm a book writer. So let's do a follow up to Funk Bass. So, how about Funk Fusion Bass? So, I follow pretty much the same format as Funk Bass, which is 100% slapping and popping. Funk Fusion Bass is 100% finger style funk. And uh, I'm already somewhat established. They're starting to get established with Hal Leonard. Went to Verdine White from Earth, Wind, and Fire. He wrote the foreword. Went to my, my friend and mentor, Abraham Laboriel. Uh, who, who endorsed it. Steve Bailey endorsed it. Uh, Victor Wooten endorsed it. Rocco Prestia from Tower of Power endorsed it, and a few others. And then I wrote a rock book. Then I wrote a blues book. And then I wrote, uh, th that's when I got busy and kind of took a hiatus from the book writing business. But a few years later, I wrote Bass Grooves, the ultimate collection. Just every kind of groove you can imagine from jazz, rock, funk, slapping, R&B, Latin, reggae, country, punk, yeah. disco. Yeah. And I've got a section called More Grooves. So I thought, who is used to playing a ton of every kind of groove, every kind of style and genre there is? Will Lee from the oh, yeah. David Letterman yeah, yeah, yeah. show. So he wrote a great forward to that book, and I got a bunch of other great endorsements. And then I uh, was talking to the Hal Leonard people, and I said, you know, it's a couple of years later, I, I've got another book in me. And Jeff Schradel is the guy over at Hal Leonard that I deal with. And he says, we have a book called Guitar Aerobics that sells very well. I'd like to have bass aerobics. So we went back and forth on the layout and the format, and that one, Funk Bass had been my best-selling book for, for years, and then Bass Aerobics just 
absolutely hit it out of the park. I just, I, I can't believe how, I, I'm glad that people like it. Yeah. And it's yeah. just selling like crazy. And uh, by the way, a couple of years ago, must be about four or five years ago, we, uh, we introduced the 20 year edition of Funk Bass, which I'm proud of. And I went to every single person that endorsed Funk Bass back in 92, called them up 20 years later and said, uh, hello, Bob Cranshaw, hello, Will Lee, hello, John Patitucci, hello, Mark Egan, all these guys. We're coming out with a 20-year edition, a 20-year anniversary edition of Funk Bass. Would you be so kind as to reiterate your endorsement that you gave me 20 years ago? Every single one of them came through. Wow. Came through. Stu Ham, Brian Bromberg, everybody. So it's it's in the book there. This is what they said in '92. This is what they said in 2012. There's a picture of me from 1992. A picture of me from 2012. And then uh, my my newest book. If you keep, I I, I think it's eight, what was it? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Actually, it's seven books because uh, one of them is is uh, Jaco Pastorius play along. So I can't really say I wrote that book. All I did, Jason, was play the bass tracks on right, right, <laughs> eight right, right. Jaco tunes, which was an unbelievable undertaking. I'm sure. But uh, I, I was meeting with Jeff Schradel from Hal Leonard at the NAMM show a few years ago, and he said, uh, we have another series called Play Like. So they have Play Like Eric Clapton, Play Like Chet Atkins. We don't have anything in the bass catalog. And I'd like to do play like Jocko Pastorius, and I'd like you to be the one to write it. And I was so very honored. And I had to be vetted by Jocko's family, and they had to oh, approve wow. me. Wow. And yeah. I, I knew Jocko a bit because uh, from my Florida years, and he, he had me over to his house. Oh, we were get out of here! Jamming really? in his living room, and yeah, what was Jocko like? You know, I've, I've talked to a couple people that work with Jocko. This wonderful bassist, Dave Anderson, down in New Orleans, yeah. and just like what, what, what? Like he's such a legend. He just like we think of him like you know like it's like this uh unappro- unapproachable like change the whole base world like what, what was he like hanging out with what was he like as a person i i guess it depends on the day oh, that really? you were hanging okay. out with him okay. and uh the, the one day when uh one day in particular i was over at his house and he just something just wasn't quite right yeah. and and he was telling stories and but it was it was just uh if I'd if I'd say he'd say something and I'd say really and he would take my hand and shake it really hard and then put his finger up to his mouth like shh and and okay. it just things that didn't yeah. really make sense but he had some great stories too sure. he put on the heavy weather record and uh, record vinyl yeah, yeah, yeah. and and he's going through and he's telling stories about what this is what was going on while we were recording this and this is what we were going to go, we recorded that and I, I said you know how do you finger teen town because I always do it like this he said no you do it like this I said really he said that's how you do it <laughs> that's how you do it that's, that's how you do it says. and I said uh, you know I read somewhere that you took a year off from playing just to practice what did you practice and he just looked at me and shrugged and he said nothing but scales and he had his his uh, Fender bass his jazz bass and he just very slowly moved his left hand fingers on a C major scale and what I remember about that was how close his fingers were to the fret, as if he was playing a fretless, even though it was a fretted bass. I don't know why that stands out in my mind. But, uh, you know, Havona, what, what, what does Havona mean? It's like a super god. And he looks up to the ceiling, and, and we're jamming, and he, he was talking to my buddy. Actually, it was Ray Sanchez. He said, I have to go over to Jocko's house, and you want to come with me? Uh, yeah. yeah. So I'm playing, and... Uh, playing Liberty City. He stops talking. says, hey, that sounds like Liberty City. And then I started uh, slapping. I said, you ever slap Jocko? And he says, never done it. And he held up his thumbs and they both kind of, his thumbs were strange. They yeah. like, they curled around at the top or something. But, uh, you know, I, I was there. I was, I was in Miami. Uh, and then, hey, did you hear what happened? And then day one, they do Jocko's in the hospital. Jocko's in, you know, and then you know, about th- three, four days later, I think he is, is when he died. But, you know, Pat Metheny, you know, I think was in Brazil or something. He, he was so shocked. He came in and all these, these musicians from all over the country, all over the world wow. came in. To, you were there for that time, that, 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 that moment. Wow. I was there, wow. yeah. And I, I saw Stanley Clark one time and, and, uh, and Jocko just jumped up on the stage. As a matter of fact, it was the same venue, but it was in a smaller room. Because uh, 
uh, and, and then I remember uh, Jocko picked up a bass and he and Stanley were jamming and then they took the necks of their respective basses and just smushed them together <laughs> and would rub them up and down and it was just like <laughs> just this, <laughs> this loud noise the audience was going crazy I'm, I'm sure the other thing I remember about Stanley that night was he was wearing a Detroit Tigers cap oh there you go I That's, remember that you were, you were happy to see that that's sure, right, right? Yeah. Detroit, Detroit guy. That's yeah. So, I mean, like, the the people that you've interacted, you're, you're talking, talking with me about Jocko, I mean, holy cow. And then, like, all these people you've interacted with and, like, getting endorsements from, like, Victor Wooten and all these people. And I'm such a shy guy. Even though I do a podcast, like, I just feel like I'm not worthy to reach out to these people. And I just got to ask, because, I mean, I think a lot of people struggle, like, with what I, like, were you always confident in reaching out to people like that? Or, like, is that something you developed? Like, how would you... Is that just your personality or? I think it's become my personality, okay. but I wouldn't say I've always been like that. And, and you raise another point that's interesting. Uh, a lot of these people get interviewed so many times yeah. and, you know, sometimes, you know, it, it, sometimes it may seem like they're doing me a favor or they're helping me out, which I appreciate. But after about three, four, five minutes, you know, People like to talk about themselves. Yeah, sure. So that really warms people up. So the people at the beginning of an interview versus the people at the end of an interview, they open up, they warm you up. Notice change as I'm, it goes. I'm yeah. asking them about yeah. themselves. This is very unusual for me, Jason, having somebody ask me questions because I'm used to being the one doing right. the interviewing. Right. So I'm opening up, but I'm yeah, talking yeah, yeah. about myself. Yeah. But no, I, I wouldn't say that confidence was always there. Um, you just got to throw it out and see what happens and if people like it that's great and if they don't well you know yeah what's the worst that can happen right no response or a no yeah. right yeah. but that's that's but a lot of time it's a yes like getting these endorsements from these people and like yes and like and what what it, and then these relationships that have developed over the years um it's it's just cool i mean that's just like a, a characteristic i it's super cool to see like all these all these superstars in our world the acoustic bass world the electric bass world and and you it's all these connections are a result of you just like reaching out to them abraham laboreal does not need to be nice to me he yeah. is an incredible gentleman leland sklar doesn't need anything from me robert trujillo doesn't need anything from me geezer butler as a matter of fact uh, uh, from black sabbath we were at a nam show and I said, uh, Giza, can I get a can I get a quick picture with you? And his people were saying, No, no, Mr. Butler has to no, no, no. Hold on. And he says, You know, this was after this person was going back and forth. I guess a little power hungry already, or whatever. And Geezer said, All the guy wants is a picture. So I have a picture with <laughs> Geezer Butler. I have a picture with Jack Bruce. You know, his daughter said, oh, well, you know, if you come back tomorrow, like between 12 and 2, he's, I said, I'm standing here right now. He's standing here right now. Can you? So me and Jack Bruce and Larry Hartke are in a picture together somewhere. So, yeah, I mean, in, in answer to your question and to your point, most people are, are very friendly. And, uh, and you know, I made a comment to somebody. I said, you know, you're a lot nicer than you have to be. It was one of those people that I mentioned. And he said, no, you pretty much have to be nice. <laughs> I, I won't say who said that, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, people like to be... Uh, David Ellefson, another guy from Megadeth. Yeah, sure. Very, and, and he, he gives me shout outs. I, I went to a, uh, uh, to the Warwick base camp. They invited me to go out. I went three years after, actually, in Machnekech in Germany. Okay, yeah, nice. <laughs> Yeah, I was sitting in on his class, and he says, hey, I don't know how many of you know uh, John Liebman, but he, he wrote a funk bass book that I have, and I practice with it all the time, and he, he endorsed my rock book also. So, I mean, people... How cool is that to have David, David Ellison, you know, like say, saying that about your book? You know, very, what a cool... Very cool. Well, I thank you for what you've done for the bass world. I mean, it's it's tremendous, and the books, and with for bass players only, and congratulations on the 500 episodes, and johnliebman.com, you got that online lessons. And, yeah, and you want to you want to ask me something so, about that? Well, yeah, yeah. Just maybe talk a bit about what you got on on that site. Well, after selling you know, uh, somewhere in the hundreds of thousands of of my method books from Hal Leonard all over the world in uh, English, French, German, Japanese, I think okay, there's there's a demand for it. 
And in the spirit of what I said earlier about going online, you know, online instruction seems to make a lot of sense. So that's why I, I launched this site. It was, boy, it was a lot more work than I ever imagined would be. Sure. But, uh, but I was, first of all, very, very careful not to duplicate anything from any of my books. So all the stuff online is, is completely separate. It, it will work hand in hand with the books. And as a matter of fact, in, in most of my lessons, I'll say for additional study, you know, the blues based book or the base aerobics book or the funk based book, whatever it is. But uh, I've come up with something that I think is very unique. And the lessons are designed so they are applicable and beneficial to bass players of all levels. Uh, and I do that by uh, demonstrating, well, each lesson starts out relatively simple and then it gets progressively more complex and more difficult but the backing tracks work all the way through each lesson so if you're kind of new or kind of intermediate and you're only comfortable playing the first two or three examples just play those until you're ready for the others and then you know while you aspire to move up to the more difficult so i play everything first at full tempo with guitar and drums accompaniment and the music is scrolling underneath so you can follow along and uh, you can also print out a pdf of each lesson for your own practice then i slow everything way down with just bass and drums with close-ups of my hands and my fingers so you can see exactly what i'm doing then i back out completely and it's just guitar and drums and that's where you can play whatever part you're ready for you want to play the groove you want to play the solo you want to play the easy part you want to play the hard part and i've got uh, all kinds of categories i have a category called easy category called basics b-a-s-s-i-c-s -S -S, yeah, sure, uh, jazz and blues rock and metal funk r&b slapping building bass lines, sight reading, soloing. Uh, I'm working on uh, a new category right now that I plan to, uh, I don't know when this podcast will be out, but uh, maybe by the time it's out, I'll have the, the newest category called beginners okay. because I'm getting more and more requests for that. Sure. And uh, I've got all kinds of ideas of uh, things that that people are telling me they want and things that I think people would benefit from. And uh, last time we counted, we're uh, pretty close to all 50 states where we have subscribers and between 30 and 40 countries all over the world, people subscribing to johnliebman.com. And I have a bunch of free lessons I put up there so people get uh, can get a taste of, of what they can expect. But I'm, I'm really happy that it's kind of hitting the spot with people that, that want to learn bass. And I'm uh, very, very thankful and very appreciative of that well you've been helping bass players for a long time and it's great to see you know, moving into the online space and being able to like uh, you know connect with everybody like you said in the 50 states and all these countries worldwide so it's very cool and you're at the forefront of all of this online education and so congratulations on what you're doing and uh well, make sure to check out fourbassplayersonly.com johnliebman.com and thanks for chatting well thank you I've, I've, I've been a fan for a long time so it's fun to sit down with you and, and thank talk you Jason me. it's mutual I really appreciate what you do and what you've done we, we have maybe a little bit of overlap between what the two of us do but I think what, what you do is, uh, is is very unique and you do a lot of things that I don't do so uh, it, it's a great resource especially if you're if you're if your preferences skew a little bit more toward the upper right and the double bass and even the classical side so thank you for all you do thanks again for chatting john folks for bass only.com john liebman.com all those links are in the show notes and great to see you in person john of course i'm sure i'll be seeing you again at nam at bass player live and all these other bass events that we will inevitably find each other at and if you enjoyed hearing from John, share out this episode. That would mean so much to me. I'd appreciate it. I'm sure John would appreciate it. And you can do that by sharing it through the app. If you're listening on the app, uh, whether it's your iPhone or Android phone or whatever, just hit that share button, share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter, email it out to a friend. That would be great. We're coming to you these last several episodes and upcoming episodes with ISB 2017 coverage. And all of that can be found at ContrabassConversations.com slash ISB. So thanks for tuning in and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.